Okay, we might get started. It looks like most people have joined us. Good evening, everybody. Hope everybody can hear me now. Um, welcome to this webinar on valuing nature in agricultural landscapes, tools from science and economics. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. Um, I would like to pay my respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us this evening. I'm joining you from the country of the Yuggera people in southeast Queensland, and I'd like to acknowledge their custodianship of the land over tens of thousands of years. My name is Martine Marin. I'm a Deputy Director of the National Environmental Science Program's Threatened Species Recovery Hub, and I'm a Professor of Environmental Management at the University of Queensland. And I've been uh, lucky enough to work alongside farmers uh, on wildlife conservation, especially birds, in agricultural landscapes for the past 20 or so years. And though I didn't grow up on the land, I was sensible enough to marry a farmer uh, who has a property in southwest Wimmera of Western Victoria. And it's a beautiful part of the world where farmers play an especially crucial role in supporting a lot of threatened species, including one of my absolute favourites, the southeastern red-tailed black cockatoo. So I'm especially excited for the opportunity to be hosting this webinar and the panel discussion this evening. And this is our third business and biodiversity webinar, um, jointly uh, brought together by the Threatened Species Recovery Hub and the Business Council for Sustainable Development Australia. We've got another fantastic lineup of speakers this evening, and also for our final webinar in the series, which is this time next week on mitigating impact and assessing performance tools for business decisions. So I hope that you'll be able to join that webinar as well uh, next week. And you'll see that uh, Rachel's pasted the link to register for that into the, into the chat. So if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you should be able to click on the chat button and open up the chat panel. So um, once you've uh, had a look at where the chat button is, please take a moment to introduce yourself. Um, we'd really like to hear who's out there, who's listening. Um, we can't see you, but um, we'd love to know who you are, the organisation that you're with, and uh, what Indigenous country that you're calling in or joining us from or residing on. So when you send that chat, if you can make sure the two button says, um, all panelists and attendees, is that right? So that way everyone will be able to see. So I'll oh, welcome Brendan Edgar from the Northern Australian Hub. Um, Stephen Ambrose, oh, well, there's so many coming up really fast. So hopefully everybody's um, tracking all the different people from around the country who are joining, fantastic. Um, WWF, um, Stephen Todd from Soil Bank. While those are coming up, I'll just give a bit more information about how things will run today. So in addition to this chat function that you're using now, um, and it's really great to see so many people joining, um, also reassures me everything's working okay. Um, you'll also see that just next to the chat button, there's a Q&A button um, down the bottom there. So uh, once we get started, if you click on that button, it'll bring up a different panel you can use to ask questions of the speakers and the panelists. And in the second half, of the webinar today, I'll be putting those questions to um, panelists. Um, given how many people are joining us, there's very likely to be way too many um, people to get to all of the questions this evening. But um, when you're looking in that Q&A panel, you can see other people's questions. And so if you want to upvote questions that you, want to, that you agree are important to ask, then we can prioritise the most upvoted questions when we get to that, uh, that stage of the webinar. And we'll also be sending around a resources pack afterwards. So that'll include some answers to some of the additional questions that we weren't able to get to today. So today we are going to start by hearing first from some of our industry speakers um, on our panel and uh, hear about their perspectives on, on what's happening in their sectors and what they think is uh, the most important steps we can take, what's most needed to make sure that we better, um, more effectively value nature in agricultural landscapes. And I would like to start um, by throwing to Tess Herbert. So Tess currently is chair of the Australian Beef Sustainability Framework Steering Group with Meat and Livestock Australia. And she has been president of the Australian Lot Feeders Association and the Red Meat uh, Advisory Council Director and also owns and runs a sixth generation farming operation in New South Wales. Tess, um, would you like to kick us off today by telling us a little bit about your work at Meat and Livestock Australia and also give us a broad sense of what you think 
are the most important things needed to improve how we value nature in agricultural landscapes. Thanks, Martine. And look, um, thank you for having me on, on this um, webinar as a panellist today. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the work that we do in the Australian Beef Sustainability Framework. Um, as Martine said, I farm. Um, we have grain-fed cattle enterprises. But we also have, um, and happy to talk about my operations later, but we also have obviously parts of the country that we set aside for biodiversity outcomes as well. But my role as chair of the Beef Sustainability Framework means that we um, produce an annual report every year and we have a number of indicators in our report which speak directly to biodiversity. Um, and in our report, which was launched in June this year, we actually make, make mention in one of our case studies of the ANU Sustainable Farms Project as one of the industry projects that's leading that. For my perspectives on, on the topic, very quickly, farmers manage over 50% of the land mass in Australia, so it's important that farmers are heavily engaged in, the, in whatever policy process is happening around biodiversity. Um, and an acknowledgement that um, well-managed beef cattle operations can um, sit side by side with biodiverse ecosystems. Thanks so much. Jess, that's a really good way to kick things off. And now um, I'd like to ask the same question of James Bentley. James, many of you will know, is Associate Director of Natural Values at the National Australia Bank. And he has worked on environmental economics for the UK government, international consulting firms, and Australia's largest irrigation company. His name is now synonymous with natural capital accounting in Australia. James, welcome. Could you please give us a brief introduction to what you've been doing lately with NAB in terms of improving valuation of natural assets on productive land and give us some initial insights into where you think we need to go next from a finance sector perspective to more effectively value nature in agriculture? Sure. Um, and look, NAB is a major player in the agribusiness sector. We lend one in three dollars to Australian agriculture. Culture. So hugely influential in this space. Um, very important we get this right. And I, I think it's interesting that we know that at the macro level, that the loss of biodiversity <laughs> equates to direct economic impacts and, and increasing business risk. However, the challenge for us is at the micro level, um, those relationships break down and, and in many ways um, they're perverse. Um, you know, we, we simply overlook or misunderstand the of nature. And I, this was sort of pointed out recently um, when I, I read that, um, you know, globally, our incentives for forest degradation are times greater than those for forest conservation. You know, that I guess at the micro level, those incentives driving behaviour are, are, are broken. And, and so we need to fix them. And we, we know that um, you know, valuing nature is part of it, but but ultimately what we need to get to is enabling our customers to invest in protection and um, rehabilitation of natural systems. And so I guess from a, you know, financing perspective, we're focused on two um, core things. One of them is, is the communication framework and, and Ali will speak about um, some of the work Climate Works um, have been doing and we've been supporting to effectively enable farmers to communicate and, and better understand their natural capital on farm and then communicate that to, to stakeholders. Um, and the second is investing in research to um, link, you know, the management of natural capital um, to farm business outcomes. Um, and we're starting to see um, some of the early results of some of that work we've been doing, but, but I guess they're, they're the sort of two priorities for us. Thanks, James. Yeah, that's fantastic. And uh, our third panellist I'd like to introduce is Tamara Harris. Tamara is currently um, Engagement Officer with ANU Sustainable Farms, which we'll hear a lot about uh, today. Uh, and Tamara has worked with land care and local land services and is passionate about regenerative agriculture and engaging with the community. Um, Tamara, as I say, we'll be hearing more about ANU Sustainable Farms in a minute, but it'd be great to hear some of your initial thoughts from your perspective on, on what would better help farmers on the ground adopt more sustainable practices and um, embrace, embrace natural assets on their farms. Thanks, Martine, and thank you very much for having me along as a panellist. I think it's really important when you're thinking about engaging farmers, which is sort of our specialty, in, in to make 
make practice change, particularly in um, understanding their natural values, is understanding that there's a few different areas or a few, a few different ways to hook, hook landholders in, whether it's that financial, their return on investment in natural capital, whether it's an emotional and attachment to the land and, and, and getting them in um, that way, or is it actually about um, the, the biodiversity, improving biodiversity? And even, even though the same action can have all those benefits, different people are engaged in different ways. And I think sustainable farms is unique in that way because we try and address all those different needs. And so we may um, hook people in or engage people in those different ways. I think what's also important about engaging people to make change in their management, particularly to improve um, natural assets, it's making it doable. It might be bite-sized chunks, like micro projects. So they might just improve one dam and that, that's doable. And that might be all they do, but that still has some great biodiversity outcomes to improve that one dam. Or just by improving that one dam, they go, actually, I want to look at improving my shelter belts or another dam or my whole property. And I think it's about making things doable by having those micro projects or those bite-sized chunks so you can do it and then sit back and see how it is and how it manages or how you see it improve your farm, if at all. And even by doing a mini project or a bite-sized chunk, you will have great biodiversity outcomes regardless. And that just might um, scale up. And I think what's important about having Having um, actions and management changes that you can do that can be scaled up, whether it's on a property level or a regional level or more broadly. Yeah, thanks, Tamara. And I like I like that um, approach. You, farmers are not one category, and there are going to be different things that are going to work in different places for different people. Well, this is um, so. This has been a really good introduction to our panel, and we're going to bring them back at the um, end of the next phase of the webinar, webinar, which is to launch into our presentations. And the first um, main speaker will be Michelle Young. Michelle is the project director of sustainable farms at the Australian National University. Michelle's a social scientist who works on a range of research and evaluation projects in both agriculture, the environment and in public health, including understanding the social and um, in economic impacts of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and studies of farm practices with the Bureau of Rural Sciences. So Michelle um, will be um, speaking to us today uh, on supporting investment in natural assets on farms. So let's see if we can get um, screens shared and microphones unmuted and we'll launch into it and while we're setting that up um, now's a really good time to discover that q a button down the bottom here we go the screen's starting to come up and feel free to start um, logging questions there and and upvoting good questions that you want us to ask uh, the panel and speakers at the end thanks very much michelle thanks martine uh, it's my great pleasure to be able to speak here today and um, i'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land um, where we're sitting online today in Canberra and elsewhere and pay my respect to elders um, past, present and emerging and note any respect for my, my respect for any Aboriginal people online today. So um, as you mentioned, I'm a social scientist. So I'm gonna start with the proposition that no one ever made a decision because of a number, they need a story. And um, our sustainable farms project started with a network of field ecologists who both scientists and storytellers working on farms who share stories with farmers supported by evidence and experiences that farmers can relate to uh, because their experiences are local and the data they collect is local. Sustainable Farms was established to leverage off 20 years of biodiversity data collected on farms by David Lindemeyer's long-term ecology group through five major studies in the sheep wheat belt. The project was seeded in 2017 with money from the Ian Potter Foundation and launched in 2018. It's now a $10 million project that goes through to 2023. Um, and within, uh, so it has grants from uh, philanthropy, uh, industry, uh, the ANU itself is a supporter, and we have a large um, grant from the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment. Within the project, we also collaborate um, uh, with and, and on co-funded projects, for example, like the um, development of environmental accounts for the box gum grassy woodlands that we're working on with the National Environmental Science Program and uh, the development of spatial indicators for predicting biodiversity that Martin will be talking to you about soon that we're working on with Meat and Livestock Australia. This is a map of our project area. 
At the ANU, we have our researchers based in three different colleges, uh, health and medicine, science, and business and economics. And our regional staff are spread across the project area. Uh, you can see their offices are located in at the uh, Green Squares in Kaura, uh, Gundagai, Wagga, Wodonga, and, uh, and um, Barambasak. So uh, the, the, the blue dots also um, represent part, uh, farmer partners who have been working with us on delivering our outreach program in partnership with Landcare Groups and LLSs. Um, so this, this, um, this diagram here provides a high level summary of, um, of how we're working to achieve our long term vision of healthy farms, healthy profits and healthy farmers. You can see on the left um, that we're continuing, our, our regional staff are continuing to um, monitor the sites in the long term study um, in the southwest slopes and also adding new sites to answer questions about conservation on agricultural land. And those data sets are being used to develop multidisciplinary projects at the ANU um, with our colleagues in economics and mental health, which David will talk more about. Our regional staff are also um, working in partnership with uh, local land services, CMAs and land care groups to build their capacity and to translate science out in the paddock. So through our program of field days, we aim to support farmers to share their stories about their management practices and bring in science expertise to support their observation. These different aspects of the project are coming together to support practice um, change on the ground and, uh, and also program development in industry and government that supports farmers to make investments in natural assets. This is a very short little talk we've got. So in the few minutes I have left, I just want to um, introduce to you two aspects of our project that are, are, are unique, I think, and also um, a, a part of um, what we think will make will create successful change. The first relates to the scale at which we work. Many of the projects are working to create change on farms take a transformational whole of farm systems approach. And we recognise that um, maybe not all farmers are interested in, in looking at changing the whole system. So our approach is to engage farmers in targeted management practices. This is also partly because um, we're about translating out the science from the long term monitoring and that science really supports um, advice on, on specific management practices. And on the screen in front of you, you can see the front page of a book that we've just produced and we're about to launch. Um, which uh, goes through the management projects that we're advocating. We've, we've chosen 10 that we're working specifically on. And you can see a few examples here. We're looking at protecting paddock trees, improving farm dams, protecting native pastures, establishing native shelter belts, protecting rocky outcrops. So um, these, these management pro practices, they provide um, opportunities for us to um, to work with farmers in an incremental way. And, uh, and basically they support the development of cognitive maps that, that integrate ecological concepts and build understanding in science around biodiversity and the importance of biodiversity as an indicator of landscape health. So we try and bring in that broader understanding of science and ecology, as well as um, uh, research around the co-benefits of investing in, in, in these management projects. We've found that despite these projects being part of um, NRM work for, for decades, um, there's still a huge thirst in the community for information about how to do this to support biodiversity and also to, to understand the co-benefits. And we see that the positive experiences associated with these practices motivate continued learning. So as Tamara was saying, we think that if we can engage the, a broader scale of people in these projects, then we can scale up to change across the landscape. The second point is that we work on a relational model of change. This is really important. Our staff are part of their local communities and they're out working on farms most weeks of the year. Just to illustrate this, I've got a few pictures of the team out there collecting data, looking under tin here for reptiles, checking next boxes, collecting water samples and discovering critters. Um, the key thing is that they're out there talking to farmers. They're talking to farmers who are running all sorts of different types of enterprises, um, farmers who have an interest in biodiversity, farmers who are more interested in, in supporting the, um, improving the value and the productivity of their land. And they, ask, they answer um, questions you know, about species identification as well as um, giving advice about major investment decisions on how to fence off a remnant or put in a farm dam. 
But the value of what they do is um, much more than these one-to-one -one interactions. The team works alongside people from a range of different agencies and brings together people from different backgrounds to share information that supports farmers. So what they're really doing is, is building networks of people um, whose wellbeing and business outcomes are enhanced through engaging broadly with biodiversity. In the last couple of years, um, I've seen on numerous occasions how highly people in the um, project area value the type of expertise that the team has to share. And as part of the evaluation of the Sustainable Farms project, we'll be exploring the role that the field network plays as science specialists in regional communities. We think they have an important role um, as part of the feedback loop to support adaptive management. And so I guess my, um, my key thing here that I wanted to get across is that for any organisation or any um, project that's been developed that's looking at how we support farmers to invest in natural assets, um, the role of field ecologists and long-term monitoring um, has got to be considered an important part of um, any platform like that. So thank you. Thanks. So much, Michelle. That paints a beautiful picture. Fantastic um, richness of learning from such long-term partnerships. And I'm glad you showed us inside that book for a few pages because as soon as I saw it, I wanted to click on it and open it. So maybe um, we'll be finding out how we can get our hands on it <laughs> during the webinar. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the next speaker in the series this evening is um, David Lindenmeyer, who is a fellow deputy director of the Threatened Species Recovery Hub and research director of ecology for sustainable farms. Um, David is a very highly awarded researcher. Many of you, I'm sure, will know him and his research. And his group uh, has over 20 years experience conducting biodiversity research with farmers in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. Um, and he'll be talking to us today about farm sustainability and business, new insights, new opportunities. Thanks, Martin. Um, and I'm going to be asking Heather on a regular basis to change the slides um, from my end. So this builds on, on Michelle's, Michelle's talk. And, and really this project is, is very much a partnership, not only between the Threatened Species Hub, ANU and Sustainable Farms, but links to um, various land care groups, uh, LLSs and CMAs, sort of right across sort of southeastern Australia. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So I, I don't think there's anything new here in the sense of the extraordinary challenges that are facing people working in agricultural areas from the demand to produce more food, um, notions that Australia is going to be Asia's salad bowl, which I think is somewhat far-fetched, but issues to do with farm productivity and degradation are massive, together with you know the enormous constraints that people are uh, are under in terms of, of profitability and and uh, dealing with finance, and then the the massive emerging problems with farmers' mental health, and then then other challenges such as um, dealing with extensive CO2 emissions and, and the reality of climate change together with the reality of biodiversity loss, which Australia is one of, sadly, one of the leaders in the world. And I think there are other emerging issues to do with animal welfare and the fact that the vast majority of people in Australia are not in rural Australia, they're in, in urban centres. So even if we just take the second one of those, those points and go to the next slide, <clears throat> The, the notion of land degradation globally is just extraordinary. So presently, the, the estimates are that an area the size of Russia, or potentially even larger, is degraded. And that directly impacts over 3 billion people with an es estimate of over $14 trillion to fix that problem, which is you know, a large proportion of US GDP equivalent. And even in our own area in Oceania, we've, we have huge areas of degraded land uh, in, a, in a place, for example, such as the Murray-Darling Basin, where we've, we've uh, removed over 6 billion trees uh, in, the, in the last 100 or so years. So the, the challenges are massive here, not only at a, at a global level, but also a national and regional level. If we go to the next slide. We, we can see that people have actually started to map this. And, and, and Australia, again, is not immune from the kinds of problems uh, associated with land degradation and its long-term impacts, not only on biodiversity, but on the actual productivity of the land itself. Go to the next slide. So what we've wanted to do with the collaboration across NESP, Threatened Species Hub and Sustainable Farms is to really start to look at 
condition of vegetation in different settings, be it plantings or remnants or, or riparian areas, and start to think about what are the drivers of those changes in condition and how can, how can you improve those conditions, not only for productivity of farms, but also biodiversity. So let's go to the next slide. So over the past 22 years, we've collected extensive data, not only on the biodiversity on farms, but also on the condition of those vegetation assets and then begun to look at the relationships between the two. And then also the impacts of interventions on farms that attempt to improve the condition, not only of the vegetation, but also the biodiversity. So essentially we're looking at links between interventions, changes in condition, and then changes in condition and changes in biodiversity. And then the final steps are to look at those links to not only farmer, uh, the farmer's profitability, but also farmer mental health. So if we go to the next slide, as Michelle was pointing out, one of our, our key themes in, in our work is to look at how we can improve the condition of various natural assets on farms, be it shelter belts, uh, replantings, uh, rocky outcrops, etc. Now, if we go to the next slide, one of the most important assets on a vast number of farms throughout the Murray Darling Basin is actually farm dams and availability of water. So there are estimates of over 650,000 dams in the Murray Darling Basin. And at the start of this year, our satellite analysis indicated that 97% of those dams were in poor condition. Now I understand that that was in the middle of a drought, there's nothing surprising there. But in fact, even outside of drought periods, the vast majority of farm dams are in very poor condition. Now the work that's been done on water quality and, and livestock health is remarkably small. There's less than a handful of papers that have actually looked at this globally and virtually nothing published in Australia. But the, the limited amount of work to date shows that improved water quality can actually increase livestock weight gain by up to 23%. So to give, the, give an example, that means that a 400 kilo animal might be, if it's drinking poor quality water, only 300 kilos. So any beef grower would know that that's actually a substantial change. We also know that, that poorly, uh, that dams in poor condition emit very large amounts of greenhouse gases. And, and uh, the extent of the, the emissions could be as high as equivalent to the landfill sector in Australia. So that work is yet to be done, but it's substantial. So if we think about what's happening here, we've got billions of dollars spent on cattle and sheep breeding, got billions of dollars spent on pasture improvement, and almost nothing spent on water quality. So if we go to the next slide and start to think about these kinds of things, as part of the, this uh, multidisciplinary project, we're beginning to look at ways that we can improve the water quality in farm dams uh, across this sector. And what we understand, if we go to the next slide, is that there are ways to improve these really important natural assets on farms through fencing around these areas, through replanting, in strategic areas through creating hardened access points. And all sorts of outcomes come from this. Not only do you start to see improvements in animal health and uh, better quality water, but you start to see these kinds of areas beginning to improve in terms of their value for biodiversity. And for example, we see massive differences in levels of, of E. coli between dams that have been well managed and dams that haven't. In fact, that relates strongly to, to animal health requirements and eventually animal welfare. So if you move to the next slide. So beyond this work on farm dams and looking at the potential outcomes, we know, for example, sorry, if I go back to the previous slide, we know that um, doing these kinds of interventions in farm dams has an enormous cost benefit. So the, so the cost of putting in these amendments these renovations of a farm dam are relatively trivial uh, compared to the outcomes in terms of improved production. So there's been some empirical cost benefit analysis looking at precisely that. OK, 
Okay, let's go to the next slide. So in that context, we want to start to look at the value of these different natural assets in an accounting framework. And the, the accounting framework that we've used in other studies within the Nest Pub in particular, and in the forests in Victoria specifically, has been the SEA system, the system of economic environmental accounting developed by the United Nations. And the aim here is to apply that approach in a different setting, in an agricultural setting, using long-term data sets uh, gathered for biodiversity and other natural assets and putting them into an accounting framework. So if we go to the next slide, essentially we wanna look at both qualitatively and quantitatively the different values of the different natural assets on farms and put them into a, an accounting framework to understand uh, what are the, are the various values uh, in an economic and environmental context and how might we also uh, look at these different assets as they change through time. So we've applied this, this approach uh, in a broader context in the Victorian forests and we've been able to compare the different values, for example, of water versus agriculture versus forestry versus plantation forestry versus tourism. And it really is a, a, um, a, an outstanding way to start to think about how you might make particular policy, policy decisions and, and other decisions uh, in, in an environmental context. If we go to the next slide, please. So this, this slide starts to, to help us to think about uh, vegetation assets, particularly in the context of farm dams and how the vegetation around farm dams in the economic and environmental accounting space might start to, to, to begin to be thought about, particularly when it's allied to a cost benefit analysis. We know, for example, that there's greater weight gain, there's uh, less sediment in dams, which means less cost of cleaning. We get a better biodiversity outcome. And surprisingly, we also get a mental health, health outcome because many landowners actually elect after they've renovated their dams to start to put in picnic tables and other assets around those farm dams as part of their mental health, which is really important given many of the strains that many of our, our farmers and people on the land are dealing with. So there are not only significant financial gains, but also other gains that come from these kinds of investments. If we go to the next slide, please. So through the environmental accounting process that, that's being developed at the moment, led by Michael Varden. The, the idea is to, to construct water accounts, land accounts, carbon accounts, and the carbon accounts will not be based on models. They'll actually be based, in fact, they are being based on direct field measurements of different vegetation types, including replantings and the like. And the sense is to try to begin to think about uh, these accounts and also the, the multiple co-benefits, for example, biodiverse carbon in farming landscapes. So let's go to the next slide, please. So there's considerable further work that's now being built on this platform. One is to think more broadly about what constitutes a reasonable environmental stewardship where farmers would be paid for managing uh, improved condition of natural assets on their farms and how that would link with a certification process. There's been a lot discussed about biodiversity certification and there are good schemes and not so good schemes. And so it's important to think about how those fit into the picture, how they're, how they're appropriately verified, and then linked with, with other data sets, including those for carbon. So for example, how might we get some of the investments around the ERF into environmental stewardship and certification? And one of the key outcomes here is that there's really important environmental monitoring that needs to take place to verify what's appropriate certification and stewardship. Another aspect of work is thinking about sustainable finance. And this is really important because the amount of money to remediate degraded land worldwide is more than is ever going to be available to do these kinds of things through normal means such as grants and loans. So if we go to the next slide, one of the, the really interesting thing, things to think about here um, Perhaps we've got a, a double up slide. Can we go to the next, the next slide? Maybe that's been removed. So, so let's go back. Um, one of the things that we've been looking at with, um, with Bruce Chapman 
from this from uh, the College of Business and Economics is some work around looking at revenue contingent loans and thinking about how we might be able to to support the financial arrangements that are needed for farmers to be able to improve the natural assets on their farms. So this is not unlike what's happening in the higher education sector at the moment, where you begin to pay back your loan uh, once you have the revenue available to do that. And so most of the modeling that's been done in that space shows that for sensible loans around um, improving farm dams and how much would be required to improve the, the, the dams on a farm, most of the repayments can be made on an average farm within eight to 10 years uh, with the, all of the dams on the farm having basically been improved in that time. So this then fits into the notion of what is sustainable finance and how that fits against stewardship schemes and, and certification schemes, and then also the verification of the finance itself. So I might leave that there, um, but there's, there's a lot to be said in this space and I'm happy, more than happy to follow up with, uh, with anybody if they want to contact me on that email address. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, David. That was a fantastic example of really bringing um, round, from understanding the, the biodiversity and, and benefits right through benefits I hadn't considered um, around improvements in, um, in, in dam uh, infrastructure around um, climate benefits, weight gain benefits, and to bring that right around to understanding the financing arrangements is really interesting to hear. And I've seen firsthand how much benefit you can get from these sorts of interventions in terms of biodiversity um, for um, you know, repairing growling grass frog habitat on our place in, in Western Victoria. So I'll be really interested to follow up on some of that. Um, thank you. Now, our next speaker is um, Martin Westgate, from also from Sustainable Farms. And um, I will just remind people before we move on, sorry, that um, the Q&A is open and we're getting lots of questions in there. So please do upload those. So Martin is a research fellow in ecology at the Australian National University and who studies how uh, scientific information can be used to understand and mitigate human impacts on the environment. And he's going to be talking about predicting farmland biodiversity. Thanks, Martin. Great, thanks Martin. Thanks uh, to Dave and Michelle as well. So, uh, hi everyone. My name is Martin Westgate, as uh, Martin just said. I work with Michelle and David at Sustainable Farms. Um, and my role here is in um, is in trying to talk about the science that, that we've been doing. David gave a good broad introduction, but I'm going to talk about a specific project we've been running the last uh, couple of years now. And um, by ourselves, but also more recently in collaboration with uh, MLA. Um, so, that was motivated by a question. Um, so we've got 21, 22 years of uh, farmland biodiversity data. And, and there's a question there about how we can use that to help farmers. And in principle, there's a lot of things that that can tell us. It can highlight on a very simple level, just the fact that farms are very biodiverse landscapes and that they have a huge biodiversity value that isn't always recognized. Um, I think uh, a really valuable thing by communicating more about our findings is supporting engagement with nature. I think there's a lot of interest in, in Australia and, um, and from around the world in Australian biodiversity. And we know that in, in other countries and within Australia, the people will travel just to see a particular bird species, a particular mammal species. And, the, and so there's a tourism element, obviously not right now, but hopefully in future. Um, but our conversations more recently, and particularly with MLA, are about um, demonstrating environmental performance. So if, um, if a farmer wanted to say, I have good biodiversity, or if they wanted to say, how can I improve that biodiversity? There is science on that, but it's not always easy to find. It's not always easy for them to be able to, to demonstrate that value. And so while we have a long track record within our lab and within sustainable farms of, of doing good science on this, communicating that and making it available to people is, isn't always something we've been able to do as effectively as we'd have liked. And so this project has really been about taking all of our data and making um, robust conclusions from it, but also communicating those results. And I'm going to share some prototype work on that tonight. So my brief and, and that, the team that I've been working with was to say, can we predict biodiversity on one farm? Um, can we produce some sort of website where someone can say, I live here, uh, I have uh, patches of vegetation, I have these attributes, tell me what birds I should expect to see. Um, now, 
that that's something we can do. Um, but we, we set ourselves a few more targeted goals. We said it would be nice if you could tell something about individual species as well as total biodiversity. We said it would be nice if, um, if you could use as little field data as possible so that farmers don't have to go out and have either specialist training or bring in people to tell them information that then parameterizes the model. Critically, we need to be able to say things about farms that we haven't been to, and that sounds a bit obvious, but um, we could very easily summarize the results from our, our farms, but of course we don't study every farm in the uh, sustainable farm study region. So we wanted to make predictions about farms we hadn't been to that were statistically robust. And we also want to make predictions across whole farms, not just for the individual patches where we tend to do our studies. So we've, we've done quite a bit of work on this now. Um, this is the most sciencey slide that I've produced and I'm gonna talk through it a little bit, but, but don't be too frightened. But um, basically, there's a whole bunch of things that can affect biodiversity. And so there's, this, there's a very complex scientific question about saying, OK, what is on a given farm depends on where it is. Um, so at the regional scale, that might be affected by your climate, by your latitude, by your elevation. So there's the, 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 this bottom level here, there's some, there's some factors that affect very broad scale patterns of biodiversity. Within a landscape, there's, there's a, a slightly more refined set of things to do with your topographic position, to do with how productive in terms of vegetation your farm is. And then at the individual scale of individual patches, there's things to do with how much tree cover you've got, how much mid-story you've got, whether you have aggressive bird species on your um, property, those sorts of things. And so what we did, and what is shown on this, this y-axis here, is we came up with a set of hypotheses that said, okay, well, maybe the thing that affects birds most is presence of noisy minor, maybe it's the presence of mid-story, maybe it's both. And because those are quantitative hypotheses and we have data on them, we can test how well they fit our existing data. And so that's what this, this, the x-axis shows, things that are further along on the right-hand side fit the data really well, things along the left-hand side fit really poorly. And so what we see is that within each of these different scale categories, there's some models that are bad and some that are good, but in general, and this is a slightly strange and in some ways quite annoying result, the more things you put in your model, the better the model gets. And what we find is that in practice, um, adding patch scale, landscape scale, and regional scale variation, you glue them all together and you get a model that fits better than everything did before it. Now, in a sense, that validates decades worth of ecological research because we already knew that, um, that climate affects biodiversity, that, um, that productivity affects biodiversity, for example. But uh, to see it all in one model is, is quite interesting. And what that leads us then is to say, well, how do we glue it all together? And so to answer this question of what lives on your farm, we've generated this website. This is online now, but it, it's, not, uh, it's not in its final public form. So this is very much a prototype. But just to demonstrate what we're talking about here, um, this is a, a very simplified map of our, of our region. So this is the Bureau of Statistics SA2 regions that define the sustainable farm study area. So we're going from sort of mudgy and uh, what else, orange at the top here, um, down through Gundagai and Young, and then down the blue points of Victoria. So crossing the Murray around here somewhere. And basically what we say is that we know that the region that you're in will affect what birds you have on your property. So I'm going to pick something close to home for me and say, well, let's click on yes and say, well, here's some basic attributes about that place. Um, you know, mean annual temperature is 13 degrees, has 17, 700 mils of rain. If you wanted to see some details about that, you can click on each of these and say, well, look, it's about in the middle of a set of um, regions in terms of how much rainfall they get. Um, so that's, that's, just to, to give some basic information about where you live. But the important thing then is to say, well, look, I live on a, on a farm that has, let's just say for this argument's sake, say I have one patch of remnant woodland. Um, we know that these attributes of that particular patch affect which birds will live in it. So uh, these are set to averages right now for the whole study area. But if we were to say something like, okay, well, uh, Mid-story is the amount of woody vegetation is between two and 10 meters tall. If we say, well, I've got about sort of 10% of that, but I, the amount of woody vegetation surrounding my, my particular patch is, is a bit low. It's about 6%. And you'd say there, what that does then is it gives us a prediction of the biodiversity of that study region. And coarsely, we can make an estimate of the number of bird species. So the estimate for this patch is around, what's that, around 14 bird species. Obviously, there's a bit of error around that. But what this tells us is that if you had uh, much more woody vegetation, you could expect to get somewhere closer to 17 or 18 species. If you had very little, you'd be more around 12 or 13. Um, 
perhaps more interestingly, depending on you know what sort of information you want, here are the predictions that, that underpin that, that result about the number of bird species. So the most common, uh, the most likely to be observed species would be an eastern rosella, but there's a lot of other common things in here, magpies, galahs. So per parrot's quite unusual, and in fact that's very prevalent in that region, but not more broadly. So this, this plot gives us a, um, a relative percent probability of uh, observing those species. So it's per parrot almost 40% more likely to be found in this region and in a patch with those properties than in an average patch. Um, but like we said before, we didn't want to just be able to make predictions for um, individual patches. We wanted to say, well, what if I actually have uh, two vegetation patches on my farm and some of them have different amounts of woody vegetation, maybe they don't have noisy miners in that patch, and you get a new prediction that, in which you'll notice that the, the species that are suggested by this have changed. Also, the richness has gone up. So uh, obviously, if you have more woody vegetation, you're expecting to find uh, more bird species. That's quite a jump from the, uh, the 15 of before to somewhere closer to 24 bird species there now. And um, some really unusual things starting to appear brown thornbills. I mean, superb fairy wrens are very common, for example, but a very beautiful species. I'm a big fan of crimson rosellas myself. So this, this tool um, will be live soon. It's uh, in many ways a first draft and we're, we're open to, to feedback on how to improve it. But what we're aiming for is a way of predicting for an individual farm with some attributes that, that people can, can easily alter and change. It'll tell them, uh, give them an estimate of what they'd expect to see on their farm. Um, so just to summarize that, we've found out from this process, um, or rather we've verified an expectation that, that birds in, in, across the sustainable farm study region, across those whole farming landscapes, respond to processes at multiple spatial scales. They do respond to climate, they do respond to uh, the productivity of a given landscape, they do respond to uh, the habitat attributes of a single patch. Um, the, Fortunate thing is that uh, given the amount of data we have, we can quantify individual species and collective species responses to all those variables. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're in our prototype phase, so maybe this app needs some work, maybe there's things that people want to know that they don't currently have. Um, but the benefit of this, I hope, is that eventually someone will be able to say, I know that my farm has particular attributes and here's my expected biodiversity. Uh, they could use that to make an argument that they're doing a good job in terms of biodiversity if there was some sort of certification process and if this model was validated a little more. Or they could do something simpler. They could say, oh, wouldn't it be interesting to see if I do actually have these bird species on my farm and use it as a guide, um, which I think is a, is a nice outcome as well. Um, there is a potential to expand this to, to look at other animals. We, we've got data on reptiles and mammals as well, but um, you could in principle apply it to other regions or to other taxonomic groups. So that would require some changes to account for different data sources. Um, so I've produced this in collaboration with David and Michelle, but also with my, uh, my colleague, Castle Hingey. So um, please feel free to uh, contact us if you're interested in that. Thank you very much. Fantastic. That's the second time I've wanted to click on something in someone's presentation. Um, I can't wait to see that tool come out. I wish it covered my area, but I can see I'm going to have fun playing with it anyway. Um, okay, so to keep things moving, we'll move on to um, our final um, main speaker for this evening, Ellie Court. So Ellie currently leads Climate Works's um, Land Use Futures Program. This is a cross-sector initiative supporting the shift to sustainable food and land use in Australia. Um, and Ellie's here to talk to us today about that program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, and yeah, thank you for inviting me to um, be involved in this event. It's uh, really exciting to hear these other presentations and all the great work being done uh, in sustainable farms. Um, I think compared to my fellow panelists and their organisations, uh, I and Climate Works are relatively new to the world of valuing nature and natural capital. Um, and really the brief I've been given, I think, is to um, touch on the work that we have done in that space, but then broaden the view a little bit to the Land Use Futures Program, which, uh, which, which does look at a bit of a higher level. Um, ClimateWorks had little exposure to this area until the last two years when we worked with NAB and the Queensland Government and others to run a Natural Capital Summit and produce a Natural Capital Roadmap, which we published late last year. Um, one thing I've been reflecting on um, as someone with coming with relatively new eyes to this space is that this term natural capital 
is a it can be a really nebulous concept, something that everyone seems able to define differently and um, which can cause a lot of confusion. And um, I've observed um, uh, at least three broad understandings of this term, none of which are mutually um, incompatible, um, but which it's, I found it quite useful to separate out. Um, the first, I think, really focuses on revealing the hidden economic value of, um, of the environment and of, of natural assets in a healthy state. Um, <clears throat> and the idea here is that we should be thinking of the environment as an asset like any other asset which delivers economic value and which when degraded represents a loss of economic value. Um, and I think the focus of this kind of understanding of natural capital um, seems to be on quantifying the direct economic value of specific healthy natural assets, soils, waterways, biodiversity, um, dams, um, on a specific piece of land for a specific purpose, for example, for an in informing how that land is valued. Um, or expressed another way, trying to def define the causal link between specific healthy natural assets and specific economic benefits. Um, I think the second way that I've observed uh, this term being used is, is um, really focused on uh, uh, providing financial incentives for land managers for the public good value of a healthy environment or healthy environmental assets. And that focuses on healthy natural systems as a public good for which land managers are the stewards. And the focus there is on defining what those public good outcomes are that should be incentivised, getting the architecture, the governance, the standards, the revenue streams in place, um, which I think quite a few of our speakers have already mentioned. And clearly the two aren't mutually inconsistent, but should be seen as a spectrum. I think a third understanding is, is that the term is often just used to mean the environment and the need to conserve it. Um, so I found it useful just reflecting on those different uh, ways in which people use this term. Um, so following the summit we ran and the roadmap we produced, we have um, uh, partnered with NAB on a follow-on piece of work, the Natural Capital Investment Initiative. Um, and this program is seeking to develop and pilot a broad-based system of natural capital measurement with a focus on what, what will be effective in unlocking incentives for land managers. Um, the project is taking a human-centred design approach to ensure that system is fit, per, fit for purpose, specifically that it meets the needs of farmers, especially around cost considerations and uh, uh, those who might provide incentives, while also being scientifically, scientifically robust. And the key steps that we've taken and are, are planning to take is um, first developing what we're calling a maturity model. Um, so identifying the on-farm practices that improve natural capital that are being implemented now and how they're being measured um, by different land managers and farmers at different levels of maturity in implementing those, um, those, those practices and measuring them. Um, so that's why we're calling it a maturity model, which with three levels of maturity of natural capital management and measurement. Um, the second step that we're in the process of um, doing is developing a draft system of natural capital metrics. So this is a framework for what's important to measure across different types of natural capital and different land use types and farming systems and builds on a lot of, a lot of the work that's been done over decades in this space already um, and applies that maturity model to that framework to work out how you might measure each thing at each level of maturity. Um, and, and some of those things you might not measure at some levels of maturity because it's too expensive or it's too impractical for someone at that level of maturity. Um, once we've done that work, we're planning to um, do some engagement around this framework and the maturity model, uh, additional engagement, um, and uh, welcome anyone who's interested in um, being involved uh, more to reach out um, to me for more information about that. And then looking at specific use cases um, and incentives. Um, and uh, James is obviously um, representing NAB and part of this program. So he might like to, to add something in the, in the panel discussion session about the program. So that's the, the natural capital work we've done and are progressing. We're also undertaking a broader program of work uh, uh, called the Land Use Futures Program, 
Um, and this is uh, a collaborative, what we call backcasting exercise, not directly focused on natural capital or, or valuing environmental assets, but rather on the potential long-term pathways for sustainable food and land use for Australia. Um, it's looking at exploring the scale and type of changes that might be required at a national level and at regional level um, to produce sufficient nutritious food within environmental limits. Um, so to address some of those interlocking challenges that David mentioned um, in his presentation and then identifying the key transitions that would support that. Um, and the program's part of the Global Food and Land Use Coalition, uh, which last year published a set of 10 critical global transitions needed um, to achieve sustainable food and land use. Um, where, as part of our program, we are this week publishing an assessment of how those global transitions might apply to Australia, uh, what the challenges and opportunities are, and how Australia is progressing against each of these with a view to adapting them to Australia in a deeper way. Um, I, uh, I believe that this kind of macro level work is quite complementary to all of the work being done on valuing nature. Um, I, I would see natural capital and, and the tools and systems for uh, assigning a value to nature within existing policy and financial decisions is, is one tool and the macro level analyses like what we're doing um, help reveal what degree of impact or change those tools and others might need to add up to um, and try to reveal the trade-offs and the interactions at a landscape and system level rather than at an enterprise level. Um, and also help us track progress and adjust course along the way. So really, um, that, that's, that's all I was going to cover by way of uh, opening remarks, and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thanks, Ellie. That's um, fascinating, Annalines, um, in, in a really interesting way with this massive year for biodiversity, given that we're also amidst the process of negotiating new post-2020 global biodiversity goals that need to integrate with the sustainable development goals and, and so on. So we need to get better at this. So this has been a fantastic discussion. We've really heard about tools that operate at all sorts of different scales and um, from the specific um, to the strategic sort of levels. I wanted to open up um, first, just back to our three panellists, um, to ask for any reflections on these talks that we've heard so far, or to, to comment as practitioners from industry with on-ground experience, what you think um, is uh, the value of these things we've just heard about, uh, what we need to realise that value in terms of changing industry practice. Um, Tess, can I um, throw to you for some brief remarks first? Absolutely. Thanks, Martine. And look, thanks for the presentations. Um, um, I'll probably attack it at, at what you guys have identified as a macro and a micro level. So, um, and just to clarify, first of all, the work that I do with the Beef Sustainability Framework sits under the leadership of AMAC, the Red Meat Advisory Council. Um, Meat and Livestock Australia are involved through providing the secretariat and a manager of the framework. But the framework itself and the sustainability reporting is undertaken by a steering group, which is um, made up of a whole lot of people from right across the beef supply chain, including um, lot feeding, um, live export, um, processing, um, and producers as well. So, um, and I've provided also a link to our, our most recent annual report if anyone is interested. Interestingly, at a macro level, and I'm going to take hats on and off here as a producer and as the chair of the framework as well, um, at a macro level, um, I was involved in some of the early consultation on the National Farmers Federation Biodiversity Certification Scheme, which I think a couple of people have alerted to already during their presentations. And I see that as a tremendous opportunity for... Um, um, uh, it's a very consolidative process in particular, but it's a real opportunity for farmers in particular to be um, valuing their natural capital and to have some sense of... Of, um, we often get pressure um, externally um, to change practice on farm. And um, a certification scheme, um, however that will look, and I don't quite know what it will look like, will certainly provide some certainty as to on farm what some of those practices will be. And I can see the research that ANU Sustainable Farms are undertaking as contributing to that 
really interested in Martin's presentation on um, where the birds are because um, on my properties we have um, some um, 500 hectares set aside for the swift parrot, um, which is just a really recent innovation through local land services. Um, and I, I'm, I'm in particular interested in seeing how that process goes as we go forward. So, um, and finally to touch on something that James will talk about in more detail, which is the financing of it. Um, the struggle that I have with the certification scheme is, is what market driver there may be for that. Um, and if it's a branded product type approach, um, then that's really difficult to implement at a market and at a market scale. Um, price, the price sensitivity amongst consumers, um, while people may say that they'll pay more for a branded product that is branded um, to come from a biodiverse property or for example, um, at point of sale, people, people will often just go back to price. Um, so that's the struggle that our industry has with a lot of branding. Um, even for carbon neutral brands, they have that struggle. But increasingly consumers, and our document is a very customer focused document, um, increasingly we are being asked those questions. What, what is the industry doing about biodiversity? What is the industry doing about the balance of tree and grass cover? What is the industry doing about animal welfare that David mentioned in his presentation as well? So um, we need to be able to, our report is really a collection of data and trends over time with what the industry is doing um, to address those issues. Thanks, Martine. Mm, thank you. Um, good uh, moment to hand over to James for the, your reflections. Um, I'm not really sure where to sort of leap off here, but the, I guess there's, there's so many sort of things firing away and, and maybe just to pick up um, a few threads. You know, I, I, I think having the public good in mind and to Ali's points about those definitions, um, Public good, public good, public good. The, you know, the, the private good components here are a means to an end. Where there are private benefits from natural capital, we should be funding them with private vehicles. And, and I guess the, the intent of really better understanding those private good bits of the puzzle is to enable investment into what is ultimately both, you know, a happy, happy crossover between public and private good. Um, so that's, I think, framing. Test picks up on a really challenging dynamic for, you know, what does it mean for a landholder who's got to take cold, hard cash out of their pocket and spend it on something, which is what we want many, many, many people to do if we're to fix up all, all those dams that David spoke about um, and, and, you know, and, and to see a return. And the, the challenge and the legacy we're dealing with is that, you know, when the finance sector looks at this stuff, um, you know, that cash disappears. Because we don't have a valuation system or a record keeping system or any way of capturing that value and, and historically, you know, finance, um, insurers, valuers, we've been looking at numbers. We haven't been looking at the natural capital assets. We've overlooked, we've ignored and we've forgotten how important this stuff is to us. So I guess the... The, the challenge, I, I think, for the land, there's multiple facets. One is about recognising when they make an investment in, in these things, the, the, the components of it that, that um, you know, they should get an uplift in their valuation or it should impact their credit risk. Um, the other thing from a market point of view, um, I agree it's hard to get premiums, but you look around the world at, you know, Mars, Nestle, Danone, um, Cargill, all of these entities, um, you know, massive global supply chains are committing um, left, right and centre to sourcing products sustainably. And it, and it may, and what's interesting about sort of what we're seeing in the US markets around, you know, they use the word regen ag, they poorly define the metrics, um, but the, the supply chain if you pay, pay a premium for product, um, but they will provide support to landholders and grants and things to adopt. But, but what they're saying to landholders is that this is your ticket to entry. This buys you access to the marketplace. Um, and so I guess, you know, the, the challenge for landholders is to, I guess, maintain market access through um, sustainable investments. 
Um, but you know, I, I don't want to sort of go on too too sort of much. Um, the only other thing to to note is that the other big player here that we're seeing a lot more interest from, and and you know, our large customers are, are telling us, you know, well, if you can't demonstrate sustainability, um, you know if they can't demonstrate sustainability, they won't be able to attract investment. So investors, particularly from North America and Europe are saying, well, you know, the ticket to entry for our capital is, is sustainable assurance. Now, you know, com corporate ag is a small player in Australia. It's not, not you know, it's not the predominant driver, but um, I, I guess as we respond to some of the challenges around, you know, capitalizing ag and, and investing into the landscape, we can, you know, expect that some of that capital is going to have to come offshore and it's going to come with strings attached. And so that's another interesting dynamic at, at play here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, James. And before I throw to some curly questions from the audience, Tamara, would you like to make some remarks? Thanks, Martine. Um, yeah, I guess my main remark, and this is as a landholder, um, also a sheep producer, is as a producer, it's a really complex space. And as you can hear, there's so many things happening at so many different levels, whether it's at the science level or within the financial sector or um, in, and trying to get your head around what is, how do I know when I'm sustainable? Who, what market does that open up? When I think I'm sustainable, what accreditation do I get to be sustainable? And it is a really complex, complex place to be in. And I think that's where um, universities and the banking sector and places like Nest can actually um, su support farmers in, to navigate their way through. And I think the Be Sustainability Framework is a step in the right direction in that space to, to ensure that we, we have a clear, a clear guideline, a clear road to, to know what decisions do we make? Do they fit within our business model and our business system? And um, who, do, who do I go to to get that information? As a producer, we have our own set of advisors, whether it's nutritionists and or agronomists or uh, our banking sector. And it's, it's just about adding another level to who we get our advice from in order to meet the, the needs of society and what the, the market is driving us to do, and also to open up those markets potentially for us. Thank you. Now, I will open some questions up to anyone who wants to have a go. The first one um, is the one that was most upvoted. We have so many questions in the Q&A that we won't get to them all, but we will try to send around some answers in the, um, in the pack uh, after the seminar. The, be the first question, the most upvoted one is, what are the keys to effectively addressing scalability? in valuing nature, especially on more marginal agricultural land where economies of scale can be critical for sustainable ventures. Uh, for example, broadacre operations in the Western Australian wheat belt, which are also highly reliant on chemical inputs given low soil pr productivity. Who would like to tackle that one? It's the most upvoted question. So if nobody puts their hand up, I'm just gonna pick on someone to have a go. <laughs> I don't, I don't know who's best to tackle this one. Has anyone um, worked more in the marginal regions? Um, James, you've come off mute. I don't, I, I, don't have a, I don't have the answer here, but you know, one of the you know, obvious um, you know, problems for, for farmers in that part of the world and, and looking to transition farms to a different system is um, you know, payments for outcomes. And so it, it may be that they're able to participate in, say, the carbon market and get a contract. Um, and, and, you know, that's um, one pathway. Um, but, you know, are there payments for improving local water quality or any of the, you know, biodiversity or any of the other public goods that they, they provide there? You know, it, it's, there's, there's a challenge there. So that I guess, you know, I guess how we finance and support these things and support farmers to invest is a is a real key public policy challenge here. Yeah. David, did you have any thoughts? Oh, sorry, Tamara's clicked in. Go for it, Tamara. Um, I think there are good examples of where it can can happen, and it does come down to um, having having the right knowledge and having the right case studies that are available in that particular region. I think as landholders, we'd like to have local examples of where it, where it works, where is 
actually um, valuing nature and also still being a, fitting into our business model and, and seeing it work effectively. And I think it does work in marginal areas. And I think there's a lot of um, trading advisors around that where in particularly um, the region ag space where they are showing that it can work. But I think it's important to have when we're talking about valuing nature, I think we need to have examples from all these different um, land types and ensure that it is scalable and find the work, find where it's working and replicate it and make sure it's accessible. That knowledge that's been gained from where it's worked is accessible to other people. While you're unmuted, to I wonder, uh, the next question, the next most upvoted question is actually about regenerative ag and whether farmers practicing regenerative ag have greater um, adaptive capacity in responding to climate change and, and extremes like drought. Um, do you mind if we start with you in answers to that one? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you can't generalise with these, with an answer like that, Martine. I think you could say yes. Absolutely. As someone who does practice a lot of region ag principles, I'd like to say yes, that we go into drought later and finish earlier. Um, I think there's, there's, um, you have to be careful about using the word region ag because I don't think there's a clear definition of what defines it. Um, and some people use it, the, the cornerstone being soil, soil health, other people it's um, pasture diversity, you know, I could go on and on. So I think you have to be careful, one, with the definition of it. I think anyone who is actually um, focused on improving their land, the quality of their land through whether it's soil or biodiversity and productivity will um, minimise the impacts of any adverse um, uh, um, effects such as floods or, or drought. Thanks, Tamara. Um, would anyone else like to jump in on that question? I was thinking perhaps Michelle, but you can say no because Martin's just put his hand up, so. Yeah, look, um, also not to have an answer, so perhaps not a particularly useful contribution, but um, just to say that this is something that we've thought about uh, within Sustainable Farms and with our collaborators in Fenner School, we are actually trying to investigate it statistically. So. Um, measures like gross primary productivity, for example, so the greenness of a landscape, you do see this, uh, this sort of peaks and troughs throughout the year and we're modelling that exercise and trying to see what affects it. And it looks as though there is some pretty substantial variation across the landscape uh, in terms of what affects that and how quickly it responds to rainfall. And it's not quite as, it's not certainly not a linear system. So it's not easy to model, but the difference between regenerative and traditional farming, I think is a really big question there and we're interested in doing it. So if it's, uh, Perhaps there'll be another webinar in a year's time where we present some of those results. Well, that actually leads well into the next question, which is about evaluating the effectiveness of these different tools that are mentioned for improved practice. Um, uh, so the question is that, um, you know, this evaluation is critical to evaluate the effectiveness and, and look at the rate of implementation. How do we go about measuring this? Who would like to tackle that? Michelle. Um, yeah, well, I think, um, I guess that's where there's a, there's, a, there's a number of different ways. And one thing to be aware of is that we don't necessarily have to um, be measuring the performance of every, of every um, investment on farms. You know, if we know that we've, how shelter belts operate, like from the long-term monitoring, we've got good evidence about what happens over time and what happens as a result of changes in structures and, and things. So having some, um, uh, solid evidence about um, how, how different features perform in the landscape is important. We can, um, and David can talk more about that. But why I wanted to jump in is really to um, point to the need also to actually um, bring farmers in to listen to their stories about what changes on farm. Because not everything can be collected um, with empirical evidence around changes. Um, some of it has to be to do with actually collecting stories about what farmers see change. So when they've done this, what's happened, and as a result, they've seen certain things. So I think that's really important that we actually start listening to the people who are actually managing in these landscapes and collect stories from them about what they're seeing. And that relates to actually understanding how it affects mental health too. Because a lot of the work around mental health will have to come from narratives about people's experience. 
So that's something we're trying to introduce through our project in early days yet, but we're, we're looking at that. Yeah, thanks. Would anybody else like to tackle Tess? Just quickly, and it, look, it's, it's management at a very, very national level and at a high level, but we've got a couple of indicators in our report. Specifically, we've, one of our pillars is environmental stewardship. Um, and one of the pillars in particular is um, uh, percentage of cattle producing land that has been set aside for conservation or, or protection purposes and also percentage of cattle producing land managed for environmental outcomes through active management. So um, there too, um, it's our, new, our data sets are very new and they're not perfect by any means and we hope to improve of them. And particularly the last indicator is actually based on a producer survey, which isn't ideal, but we still had um, quite a lot of uptake. And some of the questions I can see in the Q&A actually relate to some of the questions that we ask in the producer survey. So for example, um, what weed management um, practices, um, what feral animal, animal management practices are undertaken, all of those sorts of things are surveyed um, nationally for, by beef producers to produce that figure. Yeah, and I mean, um, David, maybe you wanna jump in with a final comment about this. I know it's certainly in the Nest Threatened Species Recovery Hub, um, we have many projects focused on evaluating the um, effectiveness of, of different types of interventions. Um, you know, how effective uh, is uh, envisaging the natural capital values in the way that the Sustainable Farms Project sets them out um, for changing practice? I think there's, the answer to that is at several levels. I, I think there's a, it's really important to actually, for some things to actually collect the empirical data. So for example, that's, that's what we're doing around the farm dam space. You know, what's the difference in value of, what are the differences in various measures of water quality and Martin's been leading a lot of that, that work. But I also think some of, some of Michelle's approaches to, understanding which parts of the farming fraternity are going to, to respond to certain things and, and which ones will, so which ones will always respond and often be well ahead of the curve and which ones will never respond. It doesn't matter what you do and what, what changes those in the middle that often you want to get to. So um, there's a deep social science about how many times you have to, 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 talk with people, who's telling, telling the story, um, why it's happening in the way that, that, that it happens, which particular triggers m might be important in that space. And so the, you know, in the past, a lot of evaluation has been about how many people turned up to a, to a, a field day. Whereas now there's a much deeper level of sophistication about what is it that actually will change people's practices on the ground. So I think evaluation takes many different forms and, and you know, it's as diverse as the farming community is itself. Massive challenge and one that's really had very little work in terms of what changes adoption practices on the ground. Mm. Thanks, David. And I am being told that we have to wrap up, which I don't want to do because there are so many good questions there. Um, but we must thank you so much to all of the speakers and panellists for a fantastic and really positive discussion. I've learned a lot um, about a lot of really exciting sort of emerging, emerging things. Um, there are books, there are web tools and things that I'm going to be eagerly awaiting the release of. And information about that's going to be shared um, in the resources pack, along with some answers to the questions that have been recorded in the Q&A that we didn't get to. Thanks so much to the audience as well um, for that really useful discussion. Um, we're going to open the chat back up now so that people can put any final thoughts and comments in as we wrap up. Don't forget um, to register for our final webinar in this series next Tuesday. I'll be speaking at that um, on mitigating impact and assessing performance. Um, and we'll have um, in that uh, webinar a series of other researchers, uh, industry practitioners who've been helping to bridge that gap between research and practice to mitigate industry impacts on biodiversity. So the link is in the chat there to register for that um, final webinar. 
Um, we're also putting up, I think, a link to the feedback form, and it would be really awesome when you log out, you'll, you'll see an option to link uh, to provide some feedback. Please do. Um, it really helps us improve these events. Um, obviously, we're all learning how to run these sorts of events in a post-COVID world, so it will be really useful to help shape more how we work on our resources and communications in the future. So um, we've reached that stage of the evening. My lighting has turned me into a ghost for some reason. Sorry about that. Um, it probably means it's time to say goodbye, but thanks so much for coming. Thanks for the fantastic questions. And we really look forward to seeing, um, I hope all of you next week. I should say thanks to everyone from joining across Australia, but also across the world. We had people dialing in, I see from India and Kenya. So um, fantastic to have you on board. Thanks very much.